Good morning. I'd like to call the board meeting to order. Commissioner Kolars will be leading <coughs> us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and good morning all. We have, a, I didn't entertain a motion for agenda approval. So moved. Second. We have any corrections? There was, I saw no blue folder, Lynette, so we're good. We do not have any additional. <laughs> okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Passed unanimously. I was pushing their button to turn off their phone, so yeah. excuse us for a minute. And I'm sorry I jumped a gun on you, Lynette. Are you okay? Are you okay for time? Yeah, I might have gone off the first call. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No. I apologize. <laughs> Wasn't paying attention. Um, we have in the schedule agenda for new introductions, but we don't have any new introductions, do we? Okay. All right. Very well. Our next item is a consent agenda. Is there anything that needs to be further addressed or removed? If not, I'd accept a motion to accept so the moved. consent agenda. We have a motion by Kolars. Second. Second by Morrow. Any discussion? What Very is uh, the tobacco license? That's just the standard? That, it was a change of ownership, and so it was a removal for okay. a new ownership. Good enough. Anything else? Hearing none. Or, uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> we beat it. Paul Heideck is joining us today representing, he's our MCIT consultant. He has some materials that were handed out to you prior to the meeting. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. And the floor is yours. All right. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, thank you for taking time in your busy agenda for the 2019 MCI re MCIT report to Nicollet County. Uh, we report every other year after the elections, so if we have any new commissioners or other elected officials, it's an opportunity for us to uh, introduce them to MCIT and uh, what we do and, and the program for Nicollet County. So um, congratulations and welcome, Commissioner Morrow. Um, I am your risk management consultant from MCIT. Bob Gady was the consultant previously. Uh, he retired and I've now been with MCIT about 17 months. As you may already know, MCIT is not an insurance company. We're a public joint powers entity and we provide coverage and quality services to our members. Um, and we were born uh, by commissioners. Uh, in the 1970s, affordable insurance was scarce. Commissioners got together and said if we pooled our dollars and did our own claims handling and services and claims paying, uh, we could manage this process. That was successful and then in the early 80s we added um, property and liability coverage to the trust. MCIT's board of directors is made up of commissioners, auditor treasurers, and administrators, so they, they come from where you are and they manage MCIT the way that you would. We cover 81 of the 87 Minnesota counties and 381 county-related entities like SWCDs and agricultural societies, historical societies. Um, and I won't name the 81 counties that we cover, but the six that we do not are Anoka, Dakota, Hennepin, Ramsey, St. Louis, and Olmsted, and they self-insure. Uh, we are celebrating 40 successful years of uh, working with our members and um, Nicollet County joined in 1980 so you've been with us for 39 of those years. That's terrific. Um, and the keys to that 40 year success record is MCIT's dedication to addressing the changing needs of our members and we'll talk more about that later. But it's also really members willingness to reduce the frequency and severity of claims. You see some bullets there, that, that pink section in the middle, where we talk about uh, the different things that our members do to support the program. And I would add that it's the commitment members have to the program and not viewing 
our services as a commodity. Down at the bottom in that black section, we, we have the MCIT mission providing quality coverage and services and risk management. Uh, and we'll also talk more about that later. <clears throat> if we flip open the handout on the left side uh, in the, uh, that black section, we talk about finances. Uh, MCIT is prepared both today and for tomorrow. Our rates are actuarially determined based on um, the past experience and uh, the upcoming exposures. And these rates are meant to smooth the peaks and valleys, allowing for more, um, for smoother year-to-year -year budgeting. If you look at our rates since 2010, aggregate property casualty rates have decreased over 30% and for workers' compensation over 32%. If we look a, a little closer, since 2015, rates are flat or down. Um, and that brings us to the dividend in the green box at the bottom. That's everybody's favorite. So the rates are prospective. They look going forward, and dividends are retrospective. Uh, they look to the past. Uh, and MCIT, the, the board's goal <coughs> is to never have to come to you, the members, and say, we're short, we don't have enough money to operate the trust anymore and to pay the claims that we need to, to pay. Uh, they, they don't want to do that, and yet with declining rates, um, they're still able to declare a dividend. And I, I won't read, there's a lot of words here, I won't read uh, uh, this, but I do want to read the green section so that I get it right. This is the 28th dividend uh, that was declared in, in 2018, and dividends reflect MCIT's past claim experience and the performance of MCIT's investments. MCIT only issues a dividend when it is actuarially sound and fiscally prudent. D despite declining investment income and multi-year rate reductions, the MCIT board announced a dividend in 2018. Although not guaranteed, the board is committed to returning funds to members when appropriate. And if we were a stock insurance company, those dividends would go to shareholders. But because we're a trust and, and support our members, those dividends go to the members and ultimately to the taxpayers. If we move then to the, the white section in the middle of those two pages, these charts show uh, claims as the trust as a whole. So these aren't Nicola County specific, they are the trust as a whole. We start out with the property casualty claims and you can see that 61% of our claims over that period are coming from autos. So that's anything from windshields to collisions. Um, and that makes some sense because we cover 9,000 vehicles. So there, there's a lot of exposure out there. A third of our dollars come from auto. 61% of the, of the claims and a third of the dollars. But if we look back at, at the frequency, public employees liability, which used to be called public officials liability, but since it covers all employees, the name has changed and law enforcement liability combined are 9% of the claims, but 36% of the dollars. So that we're seeing claims there that are obviously much more severe than you're seeing in auto, for example. MCIT does not experience rate the property or liability coverage, although if members are having poor experience, it is going to affect the trust as a whole and rates and dividends. Mr. Chair, could you give me an example of the public liability? Uh, a land use claim, so where, some, where, there, where there was a land use decision and somebody objected to it and they file a claim uh, and that has to be defended. So it's primarily the, the defense of land use claims in those cases. That's, that's an example of public employees liability. Mr. Chair, can I ask another question? Please. The uh, equipment that our public works people do, is that included under auto or is that separately here? Uh, anything that's road licensed is auto, so okay. you know graders, loaders, those kinds of things are are in the liability category. Okay. So um, it, that's the, the, the yellow the one. The, the trucks, sir, okay. yeah, because they're road licensed, they would be. Okay. Thank you. So then, if we look down at the workers' compensation claims, um, if we look at the the sheriff and jail operations and the highway department combined, they're fifty one percent of the claim activity and sixty four percent of the dollars. And this makes some sense because they're typically 24-hour-a-day operations and they're often high hazard, 
so to see a lot of workers' compensation claims and dollars coming out of there makes some sense. And this is why back in the 70s, carriers did not want to write this kind of business and why they charged a lot for it. You mentioned these charts are statewide charts. Would we expect Nicola County to differ significantly? Do you happen to know? I do not know okay. uh, specifically. That would be that's a great question for uh, Bruce Casey, who's the loss control consultant, to to ask. So in workers' compensation, we do experience rate workers' compensation. So your actual experience does drive your contribution in this area. And we do it via the workers' compensation experience modification factor, which is a mouthful, so we just call it the mod. Uh, and this looks at the frequency and severity of past uh, injuries and illnesses that are employee-related. And the way that it's done is every employee is put into a job class, and every job class has a rate. So you multiply the payroll in that job class times the rate, and you come up with a base contribution. And actuarially, there's a given amount of losses, and uh, an expected amount of losses in that calculation. And then they compare your losses versus that expected. And if you're better than they expected, then you would have a mod that's less than one. And if you're poorer than expected, it would be greater than one. And if you happen to hit it right on, your mod would be one. Um, so then the, your actual contribution is the base contribution times the mod. And in that red banner there, you can see uh, for 2019, uh, your mod is 0.818, so about 82%, <coughs> and so you're paying less than the base contribution, and you see the dollar amount actually is listed there for you. But then if you look farther down at your recent history, it's all been good. So you're doing a tremendous job with uh, your workers' compensation. They're, you're consistently below the expected loss level, and you're consistently paying below the base contribution. That's something to, to really be proud of. I said we would talk uh, more about coverage, and in the blue section on the right-hand side, we have a number of coverage enhancements for 2019. One of these, uh, the data compromise and Cyber One coverage, that's an emerging risk area that we've been watching closely for a couple years. In 2017, when the coverage came out, the um, coverage limits were $50,000 for both uh, first-party losses, losses you, you would have to pay for uh, things that happened here and any third-party expenses from uh, the public, we've raised those limits to 100,000 from 50,000. And uh, there was no additional charge to members for that change. Mr. Chair, can you just describe or give an example of a third-party loss and a first-party loss? Well, one of the examples of, of third-party expenses is if somebody's data was released uh, and then you had to provide uh, credit monitoring and, and uh, credit rebuilding, any kind of, those kind of services also um, if there were, if anyone brought suit over your handling of their data, that would also be in the third party category. In the builder's risk area, on structures, we've increased the limit from $500,000 to $750,000, and for contents, $250,000 from $100,000. Another area of emerging risk is drones, and this is really, really good news. Previously, if you had a drone, and you do have a drone, um, it was only covered by MCIT for limited law enforcement uses. Now we've totally changed that, and any county use is covered for liability. So it could be GIS, could be highway, sheriff, ditch authority, whatever, um, it's covered. And then in the electronic data processing equipment coverage, uh, we drop the sublimit for equipment in transit or at a temporary location. And this is really important for voting equipment. If it's stored centrally and then moved out to the precincts, there were times when it was in transit that it might have exceeded that sublimit or conceivably in a precinct you could have enough equipment that would have exceeded that. So we've totally done away with that. As long as it's covered on the EDP inventory, it's covered wherever you have it. In transit or temporary location doesn't matter. Software is covered up to $100,000 and the extra expense sublimit has increased to $50,000. And the last one is coverage for dams. Previously, any liability associated with a dam was excluded, and now we've added coverage for Class Three dams, and those are the ones that are least likely to do damage downstream. Uh, the cyber coverage, drones and dams in particular, were changes that came from 
with input from members. These were things that members wanted to see changed. Mr. Chair, uh, Paul, do you foresee MCIT putting additional coverage on the cyber piece of it? I'm glad to see you increase to 100,000, but I have a feeling that number is going to need to be revisited in the future. Actually, what we did, it, we didn't list it here, but the other thing that we put in place is the ability to buy higher limits right now. If you wanted to, you could buy 250, 500, or a million dollar limits. Uh, there's a process that you go through to fill out an application in Hartford Steam Boiler that underwrites the coverage, actually does the underwriting of that, so that there is additional coverage available. Have you seen a lot of counties participate with that? Uh, a number of inquiries. Um, as far as I know, only one county actually filled out an application. Okay. But there was a lot of interest when we first announced that. Thank you. That brings us to the last page. And I also said early on that we would talk more about the services side. So we, there's two consultants. Um, the first one is the most important one, me. Uh, I'm the risk management consultant, and what we do is we look at coverage liability and risk management issues and concerns. Uh, we review contracts and joint powers agreements from a risk management perspective. We identify potential risks and give advice on, on how to manage them. We look at how the MCIT coverage document uh, would respond, or maybe more importantly, would not respond to a given situation. Uh, on the loss control side, Bruce Casey is your loss control consultant. Um, he uh, has told me that it's a good safety program here, and I think if you look at your workers' compensation experience mod, that would bear that out. That's really proof of that. Um, and there are a number of bullet points underneath uh, the loss control section there. You can look at the different kind of services that Bruce can provide. And both my services and Bruce services are in the contribution you already pay. So there's no meter running when, when Bruce is here or, or I'm here. Then if we look in the, the blue box, we offer a number of training for officials and employees. The, the seminars and workshops that we do are uh, very well received. The, the one that's upcoming is Managing Law Enforcement Liability May 22nd in St. Cloud. We do lots of on-site presentations for county staff. Patrol is our um, Peace Officer Accredited Training Online that's Minnesota specific, developed by MCIT, LMCIT, the Minnesota Sheriff's Association and the Minnesota Police Chiefs Association. And there are currently three staff in Nicola County enrolled in patrol. And we have our training videos um, in our lending library for um, employee education. When we started at MCIT, one of the things that we do is go through all of those things as part of our orientation process. Defensive driving training with 61% of our claims auto-related and 33% of the dollars. This is still an important area for us. This is a two-hour course that we offer. Um, it's put on by the Minnesota Safety Council and the instructors are typically retired state troopers. It's been very, very well received uh, and that's done on site. We also have some online options for that as well. And if we move into the pink box with the awareness and prevention materials, these are award-winning resources uh, that have helped members uh, reduce their expenses by millions over the years. Uh, a couple of the, these resources just won awards this year. And they're in all sorts of formats. So they can be electronic, they can be posters, check stuffers, tabletop, whatever works for reaching people. We're, we're trying to meet them where they are and where they take in information. And all of these are available on, on MCIT.org. <coughs> that brings us to the Employee Assistance Program the, in the green section. The EAP is provided to all members with no additional contribution. And it applies to elected officials and employees and all of their families. Uh, and uh, it's a voluntary confidential program, but we view it as a risk management tool. And the smallest green box there in the middle says that 46 users of the program said that it allowed them to avoid either filing a grievance or a claim against a member. So there, there's really the proof that it's, it's working as a risk management tool. And we look for a utilization rate in the 4 to 5 percent range. So. Obviously, in 2017, you were there. It's a little bit less than that in 2018, which could mean that everything is going great. Um, and it could mean that, that we're not reaching the people we need to reach. So if that is um, 
your thought that, that you're not necessarily reaching people. Uh, we have the promotional materials there. They are, there are materials that are specific for elected officials, specific for law enforcement personnel, and then one for staff in general. And those two are, uh, you know, multimedia, so they're electronic and paper. So if, um, let me know if that's something that uh, you're interested in see receiving more information. Commissioner Moore, thank question. Chair. Just uh, what do those percentages represent? I may have missed it. What is it's the six percent of the workforce. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. You're welcome. Then the, the last thing is in the black box at, at the bottom, uh, we're often asked to, as commissioners, what can we do to help support the program? So supporting the safety initiatives like the safety committee and the return to work program for injured workers, attending risk management training, supporting and encouraging training and education for all employees, learning how coverage applies before making final decisions, and maybe equally as important how it may not apply having contracts reviewed for risk management before signing or approving them. We see lots and lots of contracts that have issues, but they're already signed, so there's not a whole lot that can be done with that. But usually before they're signed, they're, you, at least you would know what you're getting into if there are issues that we see. And promoting safety at all levels, because what you look for, the employees tend to do. So if, if you're on it, they're going to be on it. Uh, that concludes the report on behalf of the MCIT Board of Directors and your MCIT service team. Thank you for your continued support of MCIT. Before you run away, Paul, do we have any other questions? Or I just like the pamphlet you made out. It's very good at explaining things as you read along. Hearing none, thank you so much for your time. And thank you. Thank you for the ongoing support of our county and the counties that you represent. So, appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> we have reached that point where we are at public appearances. Do we have any individuals seeking to speak to the board? I see none. Going, going, gone. Madam County Attorney, I believe you have an item for us. Do you want me to sit there or stay here? Yeah, Whatever is comfortable for you. Maybe I'll go there for the cameras. There we go. Lynette doesn't have to push so many buttons. Today. Oh, you have a camera there? Or there you're too tired. Oh. oh, would you like me to so return? <laughs> Um, Mr. Chair, um, members of the board, I am here today to ask for permission to submit the uh, application to extend our victim services grant. Um, we applied about two years ago for that position. The crime victim services grant um, allows us to offer full-time services of court support, um, helping victims apply for additional financial support from various um, funding sources, as well as to engage in present, uh, prevention and just public education. The grant period that we would seek to apply for is October 1st, 2019 to September 30th, 2021. Um, my understanding is this is considered a non-competitive grant cycle and then in 20, after for the, the next cycle, it will be more of a competitive grant cycle. Um, so the current uh, funding that we have would be extended for two years. Um, it's uh, due this Friday. They gave us about a month's notice to complete this uh, grant application. Um, the grant is for 140000 like the grant we uh, previously received. Uh, we are required to have some in-kind um, support for that grant as well as matching funds. Um, we're also required, interestingly enough, to require volunteer hours uh, for our grant application. Um, we've, what we've utilized for that portion of the grant application is um, we've done some reciprocity and services with the um, Lesseur County Victim Service Coordinator for covering our booth at the Nicollet County Fair. And then we also reached out to Gustavus to ask um, some students to help translate some of our materials into different languages so that we have greater availability of those forms. So that's how we've utilized the uh, volunteer hours. 
The one piece that's different with this grant application is that there's more of an emphasis of applying part of that grant for direct client assistance, and this is for to have some funds available in the event that a victim has an out-of-pocket expense that is not reimbursable from another source. And so my intent would be to allocate about $500 of this grant for that purpose. That might be helping someone change locks, might be, have some moving expenses directly related to the crime. And so there's an emphasis on having that portion of the grant application. Um, so our program uh, here are some of the things that we've been able to do with that grant that we didn't um, do in the past when it was a part-time position was uh, um, obviously uh, Bonnie Peterson, our um, victim witness coordinator, is available full-time to answer victim questions, which is better than having the attorney have to be available um, for those because we're in court or in meetings, and so she is available to take those phone calls. We've started a collaborative group of um, law enforcement, colleges, CADA, and the faith community uh, to address victim needs. Um, Bonnie is working on completing a financial fraud packet that law enforcement can give to individuals who have been um, victims of uh, financial crimes, which actually covers a, the majority of where Bonnie spends her time. Uh, Bonnie and law enforcement have been doing, and I have been going to various community groups to do public presentations on fraud and scams, and I will tell you um, the participation has been um, better than expected in terms of the numbers, and we're going to conti continue offering them, and um, I think as we continue to offer them and word gets out, we uh, have more attendance. And the number of self-reports at those about people who've um, gotten the calls or gotten the materials um, has been staggering. Um, and I will call out Commissioner Kolars has received some um, correspondence to sending him a check. And he's been kind enough to share that information so that we then utilize it with citizens to say, hey, this comes, um, don't, don't fall prey to this. And then we are looking at um, uh, additional ways to reach our underserved populations um, because that's a, an, an area that has been identified as, as having need. So I'm asking for permission to submit this application uh, hopefully tomorrow or Thursday. Are there so any questions? We have a motion. Second. We have a second. Any additional questions? That, Mr. Chair. That $500, was that per client or was that a total? That was the total. Oh, really? Okay. We haven't um, identified the, we haven't in the past identified a need for those funds, so oh. I'm starting at the $500 just so that we have something earmarked, okay. um, and we'll evaluate it after the two-year cycle. Okay. Just thinking that if, you know, one person uses up the 500 then the next one comes along two months later. And, and that's a concern that um, when we did the first grant cycle, we uh, did not allocate those funds, and we were actually questioned about why we weren't doing that. And that was one of the concerns I articulated, is if we allocate $500, how do you choose where you might expend those funds? Um, but again, there's a push, and there's some training that um, Bonnie can get about how to go about allocating that or determining how to use those funds. Okay. Commissioner Kolar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Madam Attorney, we in meeting with the coordinator, we've been told how it's been working. It seems like you're satisfied with the work that's being done to assist these victims and the witnesses. I'm looking ahead in two years when this runs out, will you said it would going to be more competitive at that time. Is there any way to predict that grant running out and then where are counties like us left at that point in time. My hope is that it doesn't run out. The, the victim witness coordinators or programs that have received this grant have been fairly consistent in receiving the grant as long as we can show that we're effectively using those funds. And I'm, I'm pretty proud of the program that we've established and certainly the feedback that we've received from our, we had an on-site grant meeting, I'm not recalling when that was, maybe in March. Um, and they were pretty pleased with um, what we've put in place in the short period of time that we've had the program established. I might also note, Mr. Chair, that I've received two checks for $7,600, haven't been able to cash one of them. And not even the county attorney would cash it. <laughs> well, it's good to know. I, I do have a brief question for Ryan. 
the funding projection here is that consistent with where we have been to date on this prior grant so this would not create a ongoing because we're committing some of these dollars into 2021 so that's why I'm, it's consistent with where we are now right? right the grant amount is the same I believe and correct and the the amount that the county is responsible for just the salary and benefits is is roughly twenty nine thousand dollars which is the required match piece of it which is I, I didn't pull the numbers, but roughly what we were paying for a part-time position okay. with a lot more services. Okay. So that only increase there would be just uh, pay increases yeah. and increases. The normal, so. normal expenses that are already tagged. Right. And Any other, I'm sorry. Well, and the, the, you had asked the question about the um, satisfaction with the services. We do send out surveys, and generally speaking, those surveys are positive. And when there's a, a concern raised, we've been able to look at what we're doing and try to then respond to mm -hmm. that particular concern. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, let's call the roll. Morrow? Yes. Fuller? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Randall? Yes. No? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And we are swimming along rapidly. We shouldn't say swimming when we talk about the roads, huh? I'll slow it down. <laughs> Good morning, Seth. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board and staff. Um, I'm here today to give the county board a, a county road road update. And before I jump into that, before the meeting had started, I'd handed out this this little brochure right right here. And probably for the last probably five or six years, about this time every year, I, I drop off an updated uh, brochure. And it's a brochure, uh, it's Local Roads and Bridges Highway Users Tax Distribution Fund. And, it, and it's a nice graphical uh, explanation of how um, the Minnesota Highway Users Tax Distribution Fund um, works and where that, that money goes. I wasn't gonna go into this de in detail, but it's just an update for, for 2019. Um, one thing that's always interesting for people is, is on the back cover, it shows the amount of mi road mileage that's uh, overseen by the various jurisdictions uh, in the state. And when you look at that, between the county state aid highways and the county roads, uh, the counties in the state are maintaining about 44,500 miles. And you look at what the state maintains, they're at 11,700. And we're only second to the amount of township mileage out there. And so when you when you talk about road funding and, and the and the news that's out there, a lot of it is centered around what, what the state needs to maintain the trunk highways, and it seems like um, what's lost in that mix is is what the counties uh, need to maintain their road system. And when you look at that mileage, it's it's quite staggering um, the amount of mileage that the counties uh, need to maintain out there and on the bottom it has a breakdown of, of the amount of bridges also maintained by the various jurisdictions and uh, the county system we maintain a little over 8200 bridges in the state which is by far the most of, of any jurisdiction so I pause you for one moment Seth we have a little flood up here oh <laughs> flooding everywhere I guess we are flooding. at least it's water <laughs> yeah we're good we're good okay. yeah Thank you. Continue, please. So if you guys have any questions in the future about this brochure, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to, to answer those. So on to the county road update, and this update's going to mainly cover um, flooding issues that we've, we've seen um, this spring. Um, as you're aware, County Road 1, uh, we had to close uh, around April 22nd of this year. We had a metal culvert, a pretty large metal culvert, a 60 inch metal culvert, um, fail due to high flood waters from, from the spring snow melt and, and heavy rains um, that we received. Uh, this culvert carries County Ditch 9 water across County Road 1. And the closure right now is between County Road 10 and State Highway 22. Um, when we had to close that road, we, I immediately reached out to Stonebrook Engineering because a culvert of this size, we want to make sure that our replacement structures going in is sized properly um, for the water that it's going to have to handle. And so they performed a hydraulic 
analysis to, s to determine that, um, we are going to be able to put a 60 inch culvert um, back in. Since there's been a governor's declared uh, emergency for our county because of the uh, spring snow melt, severe winter, and uh, additional uh, rainfall that we received this spring, um, this project is eligible for federal highway disaster funding, and so I'm pursuing those disaster funds. Um, right now, for the engineering and construction and the emergency measures that we've had to take um, on this issue, we're looking at about $110,000 um, that sh should be eligible for, for federal highway disaster funding reimbursement. And so to go through that process, it's quite an arduous process. You need to get multiple um, approvals. Uh, some of the big approvals that we're, we're waiting on have gotten the information out to the different entities, but we need to get clearance and approvals for cultural resources, uh, federal threatened and endangered species, state threatened and endangered species, and uh, approval by the Corps of Engineers. And so I'm awaiting <coughs> um, responses from those entities. Uh, sometimes that takes a while to receive um, response from them as they have a very large workload, uh, even in normal conditions. And so we can't do anything out there until those approvals are received and FHWA gives their final uh, blessing on the project. Um, as of last Wednesday, we had an official signed detour um, placed uh, out there. Uh, it runs down Kyne Road 10 to um, Kyne Road 15 and then over to um, Trunk Highway 111. So I'm hoping within the next month or so I will. So, uh, just just yes. on that, because, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just so we're all clear, I think you explained this first, you can't do the work to get all the approvals. Correct. And you still have to get the approvals even though you were placing the same size culvert yes. in that spot. Because yes. I know I've been asked, why do you have to do approvals if you're doing the same? Yes. The issue is the eligibility for reimbursement. Yes. Yes. Okay. If you do the work without the approvals and the approvals come afterwards, you're out of luck. So then you're it's spending state <coughs> county dollars. Then we're spending county dollars. Right. Correct. Yep. So, Mr. Chair. I got several calls on this, and I talked to the people, and I called Seth, and he talked to the people, and apparently Facebook is saying that it's going to be a one to two year project, which Seth says that that won't happen, and I think the rumors maybe get started because number twelve is right. such a long right. process. But that's a completely different animal. Yes. Yes. And yes. Thanks, completely Seth, different I, scope. Nobody called me back after they talked to you, so I think I think they're okay. Okay. And good. there was no screaming people either. So. Sure. Well, it's so. not like you go to Walmart and buy a 60-inch culvert either. No, but uh, <laughs> it's it's the whole <laughs> approval process. It's the process right. that you need to go through that, that so slows this is that up. Is going to be concrete or steel? Or, yeah. Right. It'll be concrete. Yeah. Yep, well, concrete pipe. So, then you're really... Yep. So we are changing that. Water. Yes, yeah. we are changing that. I did have, as long as we're in that vein, there was some discussion, I think, originally that we had another culvert in that area that we were somewhat questioning. Yes, I'm I was just going to go oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that maybe I got turned no, off no, from the horse. Good. I apologize. Um, we uh, looked at culverts either side of the one that failed. Uh, just to the west, there's another County Ditch 9 crossing of County Road 1. It's a 48-inch uh, metal pipe also. Um, it's in decent shape, but it definitely is showing some age and has some issues. We also have a 18 inch uh, center line concrete pipe just to the east of the crossing that failed that has some issues. Um, both those pipes are not eligible for any type of federal highway funding as they didn't, they didn't fail. But uh, there's enough issues there that we are going to address those two pipes also with our, our own dollars. Um, what we're going to do there is something a little bit innovative and different. We haven't done this in Nicola County before, but it's being, it's being done other places. MnDOT's using this process quite a bit. And what it is is going to be a lining project of, of both those existing culverts. And so what they do is they have a woven um, fiberglass type liner. They soak it in this special resin. They pull it through the culvert. Of course, the culvert's got to be cleaned and dried out, which the contractor will take care of. 
That uh, liner is then inflated, it conforms to the contours of the pipe, and then they run a UV light through there that cures it. So uh, I try to explain this to people by, you know, when you go to the dentist and have a filling done and they take a the little bright blue light after that filling once they get it packed in, kind of the same type of curing process is, is going to happen. And these liners are, are extremely strong. They have service life up to 100 years. Um, and uh, they actually increase the flow capacity of the culverts because it's such a, a smooth material. So even though we're decreasing the diameter by just a little bit, um, there's so much less friction with, with this material that in most cases we actually increase the, the flow capacity of those culverts. So I have signed off on that work to, to happen. Um, we're hoping that that is all coordinated under, under the same road closure. Um, the cost to do that for both pipes is $57,000, but if we were to dig up and completely replace both of those culverts, we'd be pushing close to $100,000. And so this is a, um, a, a good measure to take in, in this case, and there's definitely other areas in the counties that in the county that will probably utilize this, this technology. Nice thing, it, most of the time the work can be done with, with traffic remaining um, <coughs> on the road. So that's uh, pretty nice. So hopefully that lining will take place in, in early June. When I talked to the contractor, they were a month out, probably a week ago when, when I gave them their approval. Um, but you gotta stop the flow of water to dry it out. Yes. That yep. might not happen though either. Yeah, I mean, if we it's receive well, flooding well. rains again, then yeah. yes, things will be delayed yeah. for any of this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes if the flow is kind of high, you can pump and bypass, but if you're at full capacity of the ditch system, then yeah, you're waiting until that water drops. And the forecast this end of this week into the weekend doesn't sound promising either because they're talking potential for severe thunderstorms and heavy rain setting up somewhere possibly here in the southern part of the state. So if we get that, that's only going to exacerbate the problems that we, we already have. Mr. Chair, how long has this process been in use anywhere? Oh, it's been going on for some time now, okay. probably five to ten years. Okay. And it's getting, as word gets out and, and they've been demonstrating this, uh, yeah, more and more people are utilizing this technology. And like I said, MnDOT's doing doing a lot of this work. This company that's going to do the lining for us, they they did work last year on, on I-90 lining some very large uh, culverts, and I believe they're working for MnDOT right now down by the Rochester area. So it's like a half inch or an inch? Or I think it depends on the diameter oh, okay. of, of the pipe and sure. whatnot, but I would say it's probably, yeah, a little more than a quarter inch, okay. to half Just inch. Just a stupid question. Does it have, the, when it's completed, does it have the structural integrity? If all of the metal surrounding ultimately fails out, it will still Yes, it does that? provide mm -hmm. structural capacity. Okay. Yep. Wow. Yeah, I think in here in my notes somewhere, I think it's got uh, um, a flexure strength of 2.5 million PSI. Okay. So it's, it's amazing how as strong it actually gets. As long as we're in good shape gets. with where we're, what we're trying to line, we're in yeah. good shape. Yep, your, your pipe can't be completely rusted right. out or buckling on the bottom and somewhat true and, and straight. Yep. You can use it on concrete also? Yes, you can use it on concrete also. Okay. We had the company look at those two pipes beforehand to see if it was even something that was, was feasible to do. Okay. So. Great. Cool. Super. So any questions on County Road 1 or I'll jump on to my next, next item. Uh, County Road 14 hill slide. So you guys are aware we had a large slope slide that occurred on April 18th. Um, I believe I sent out pictures um, to everyone. Um, that slide has progressed some more um, and continuing to receive heavy rains is not uh, helping the situation out there. Um, since the closure, uh, I had the maintenance crew, they built a sand berm um, along the shoulder and basically we were trying to keep as much water diverted around uh, that area from keeping it going down into the cracks that were developing on, on the bituminous shoulder and washing 
uh, more material out. Um, we also just laid plastic flat over the area that was exhibiting those cracks to keep moisture out. But no matter how, how hard we try, we still are getting moisture uh, working its way through. And that the hill itself has a long history of just water bleeding out um, through there. So I'm sure that was a contributing factor to, to the slide also. Uh, we also posted kind of road uh, 14 to a five ton axle weight to try to keep uh, heavy truck loads off, off of there. Um, I met with MnDOT and federal, the Federal Highway Administration on April 25th. Um, since this site is what they consider a, a, a large value site, um, it's 100, I think their threshold is $125,000 or more. They actually need to um, come and make an on-site visit to look at the situation for them, for themselves. And so they, this site will also be eligible for federal highway disaster funding and, of course, the process that you got to go through. And given the size and the scope, um, of the issue out there, it'll be a much more long and arduous process to, to go through. Today, this afternoon, actually, I'll be meeting with uh, Derek Dossenbrock. He's a geomechanics engineer with the MnDOT Geotechnical Office. He has lots of experience with MnDOT in these types of uh, failures. Um, purposes of this meeting, I want to pick his brain on if he thinks there's any temporary <coughs> measures we can take out there to, to slow down the progression of, uh, of the slide and then also to see what he had for recommendations because we're going to have to hire a qualified geotech technical consulting engineering firm to um, um, determine what the proper fix for, for this slide. Um, is going to be and um, also pick his brain on just what kind of scope of services um, that we're going to need that consultant to perform to, to do this correctly. And so like I said, it's gonna, I'm going to have to work through the federal highway process and of course that takes time to develop the final solution and then to actually construct it and quite frankly at this time I'm unsure what that time frame even look like, looks like. Um, learn a little bit more about, about this every day. Um, currently, half of the bituminous shoulder is, is gone. We had fairly wide bituminous shoulders out there, but like I said, this is progressing. Um, if it continues to, to progress much more, there is the real possibility, I think, that we will have to close County Road 14 to, to any traffic. And if we have to do that, that will be a significant detour for folks to, uh, to go around. What's their next bump then? So up to four and back down around there? Um, for car and pickup traffic, you could go to four and then come down County Road 21. County Road 21 is posted at a, a year-round posting of seven tons. It just doesn't have the structural capacity for constant heavy truck traffic. So the, the truck traffic is the ones that would have a significant detour around if, if this is the measure that we may have to take. It's a real possibility. So. Not sure exactly on the cost figures to, to fix this, but uh, between engineering and construction costs, uh, it would not surprise me if this is easily a $1 million plus type of uh, job. That's my report on County Road 14. If you guys any, got questions. County Road 14 questions? Just had a few calls on that also. Great. Well, that's the reality of it. Our insurance underwriter out here, he's not going to want us to leave that road open too long. <laughs> yeah, Mother Nature, she's been tough, she's, she's been after been us. Hard on us right? I mean, but it started about this time last year, and yeah. we've been under attack ever since. But Flooding this last year, people don't severe want to winter. Pardon? This is visible. People don't want to fall off the edge of the road. Oh, yeah, we right. don't want people to fall off. A little bit off. more understanding here. And yeah. Mr. Chair, also with the 1415 being shut down. That Crazy timing couldn't further. be worse, but yeah. what do you do? It's the reality of it. Yep. One of the first calls I got was a farmer. He said, they posted it to five ton. I said, that's good, isn't it? After he thought about it a while, he agreed. So. Okay. Onward and upward. All right, I'm moving on to Seven Mile Creek Park. The park has sustained heavy damage. 
from the extended flooding this spring, particularly the east side. That's the east side's been underwater the longest that I can ever remember since I've I've been here. I bet it's been under for a month, month and a half, um, easily. Um, we haven't really been able to. Well, we haven't fixed any of the damage from 2018 yet, and that damage was FEMA eligible, and we're still working through FEMA on final approvals for that work to occur. And so now we have damage on top of damage, which uh, this is going to be interesting. I haven't had this happen before, overlapping um, FEMA events. Um, the east side access road is completely destroyed. I went down with staff on um, last Friday afternoon to review the entire park and the damage. Really, it's the first time we've actually been able to get in and really look at things. The water's just finally receding, and quite frankly, we couldn't even get back to the boat landing area yet because that was still um, underwater. So we're not quite sure what that even looks like at, at this time. Um, there, there is probably thousands of cubic yards of silt that have been deposited on the east side that we'll be looking at uh, removing. And like I said, the, the road was, was completely destroyed with that much water flowing over it for, for that um, long of a period of time. So it's going to be a long time before that east side is going to be accessible again. We also had a large portion of the smart ditch on trail number eight that was destroyed. Um, trail number two, we have a large creek crossing. It's such a cute little creek most of the time, but <laughs> when it's just unbelievable, the creeks that feed in the park, other than the Seven Mile Creek that comes through there, when you have flooding events, just how much water, and it's not so much the water that kills us, but it's the amount of debris. I mean, we have whole trees coming, and I don't even know where they're coming from sometimes, but it's unreal. And what that debris does, it ends up plugging up the culverts, and then the water overtops, and then it washes everything, everything out and makes a much bigger issue. So that's what happened to trail number two at the creek crossing. Uh, the wood chips in the playground closest to the entrance of the park was submerged and has silt in, so all that wood chips will have to be removed. The filter fabric underneath the wood chips will have to be removed and all replaced. Um, there's the first creek crossing for the access road on the west side. Uh, we had quite a bit of erosion on the north side there. We'll have to be looking at how we're going to uh, fix that. More than likely, we're going to try to rip wrap and line that ch channel to try to permanently fix that issue. And we are working on cost estimates of, of what this is actually going to take to fix, and we don't have those um, ready yet. In general, even outside the park, we have lots of debris and sediment just from the flooding uh, this spring. Um, County Road 21 also always receives quite a bit of sediment from, from the bluff line. There was quite a bit of sediment to remove even from last year, which was FEMA eligible, and we're still working through that. So again, FEMA uh, damage on top of FEMA damage. Um, there is actually a meeting with FEMA uh, scheduled for this Thursday to discuss these new spring um, damages that we had to County Roads and, and Seven Mile. Um, park so all this is going on while we're trying to get our routine spring and maintenance work underway so it's uh, it's kind of wild to say the least so I don't know if you guys have any f questions about the park I'd be more than happy to, to answer those mr. chair I, I do actually uh, Seth so are we gonna wait in Seven Mile Creek Park to do anything until we get FEMA approval or what their assistance will be? Yeah, to a certain extent we will because we'll want them to make actual site. But, you know, there hasn't been an official FEMA declaration yet, but knowing that they're coming out and doing these meetings, they're trying to get a scope of, of the dollar damage out there, I believe a declaration will come. And so they want to see in person those those damage areas, especially the, the severe areas. And I, I bring that up because Seth and I talked uh, last week and 
as soon as the water receded in the park, people were calling mm -hmm. Seth and saying, why isn't the county taking care of the park and cleaning it up? They want to use it, which is great. But people have to realize that one, it's been underwater for two months, and two, again, we have to work with our funding uh, folks at FEMA to figure out how that will be addressed before we really tear into things. So people are just going to have to be patient. Yeah, the water receded out of the west side of the park not much more than probably a week and a half right. ago. So and then all the silt that was deposited there is just a mucky mess and then you're waiting for that to kind of dry up and then it rains on top of it. So it's it's been and tough. It up like concrete when it does finally yeah. get one, one discussion for the future maybe is the east side floods every year is, is is it wise to even keep that maintained as part of the park uh, it, it gets used mm -hmm. um, but again discussion for the future because mm -hmm. at this point it's it's a reoccurring it's every year <coughs> for water it's getting to be almost every year and sometimes yeah. it's been two or three different times throughout the year that right. it's that right. it's flooded right yeah. so the Mr. Chair, please. The contaminants that are left by flood water at the park areas like this, there's no way that, other than you talked about the playground stuff, needs to be removed or replaced. But what other contaminants might be left on the grass or just any any place else? Well, I can't tell you exactly what all contaminants are in that sediment, but there definitely is. Stuff that you probably don't want on you, you know. Um, what we'll do is we'll remove as much of the silt as, as we can, and then right. Mother Nature will have to help us out with, with cleansing rains. Wash it away. So most of that silt and bad materials contain, you know, to the easternmost part of the west side of the park, and then, of course, all of the, of the east side. So there's yeah. a fair amount of the park that, you know, never was inundated with floodwaters and, and silt. So plenty of good area for peoples and families to, to play and have fun. Well, when you remove that silt, uh, I suppose in big trucks when you take it out or whatever, where does that end up? Does that make good uh, garden? Mm -mm. No, I wouldn't put it in your garden, no. Not even the fish? It'll get either landfilled, um, dumped, or taken to our county pit. I see. Depends on how we accomplish that work. If we do it ourselves, but there's so much down there, more than likely we'll be looking at contractor work. Yeah. We'll make it their responsibility to dispose of it properly. Mr. Chair, just so the public's aware, the park is open though, yeah. on, the, on the west side. On the west side. Yeah. You gotta be careful as, you know, trail eight, we got by the smart ditch area is washed out, but if you're careful, you can hop over in one spot and continue on, I mean, there's, pitfalls no matter where you go yeah. in a park mm -hmm. so a little more adventurous now a little more adventurous rustic rustic <laughs> um and a lot of the phone calls i've received about our county road closures because of flooding the spring um and the park um there's a lot of unhappy people out there and part of the unhappiness is is the time that it takes to receive these disaster grant fundings to make these repairs and um, there's a lot of comments of well we don't want to wait maybe we should pass on the disaster grant funding mm -hmm. and quite frankly from my perspective I think that's ridiculous to to pass on emergency funding that, that is outside revenue streams than our normal um, uh, funding streams and so I guess I would ask the board is the board still supportive of going after these Morrow federal disaster funds. Well, Mr. Chair, I uh, said I, I I share the sentiment that the county should be pursuing emergency funding. You just look at our budget, look at our needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that the county, personally, the county is in a position to forego federal and state assistance when we have damage to this extent. Certainly, it's frustrating waiting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, maybe you do forego, but I don't think we're at that point personally. Mr. Chair? Uh, my people are anxious too, as you know, but I agree with Terry. I mean, 
if we don't get state and federal help, our taxes on our people would almost double. Is that correct, Brian? Well, every two hundred thousand dollars of county levy we would have to put into this is another one percent to the levy. So we're talking many, many, many percentage points. Yeah, many yes. percentage points. Yeah. If we were to fund this all with with tax dollars, and so I don't think anybody has said their taxes are too low. Right, I've heard. And if I might build on that, Please. Mr. Chair. And so, Seth, I, I, I thank you as well as John for talking to folks who called us. Because mm -hmm. I, I think getting information out is tremendously helpful. And I hope that we continue uh, as a county to share information about the process. Sure, reports like this are uh, tremendously helpful. And to work on alternative routes. I mean, that was part of, I think, what John and I were both hearing were, well, if the weight of this road goes down, how am I going to get my sure. trucks around? So being helpful working with the state as well on how we move mm -hmm. uh, farmers and others to move truck around is important yeah so could I you have a consensus I just wanted to make sure oh, I, I always felt it was the mandate uh, my mandate from the board to always go after these disaster funds but I've received a significant amount of calls questioning um, that so it's nice to have that affirmation from the board that uh, it's wise to continue down these uh, paths to to receive the da disaster funding that we're we're due. So, another question for Seth, as long as he's here. Uh, uh, is he? Are you done, or you have some more issues, don't you? You still want oh. to talk about? You still want to about, talk about twenty one and a few others yet? No, no, I'm oh, good. You're done. Okay. No, nope, those are the biggies I wanted right. to talk about. Very good. Anyway, uh, County Twelve has been closed about a year. Yep. And. Uh, I know at that time Jim Stenson brought a motion out to help reimburse Cortland Township for their expenses on their township roads because of increased traffic. Has any of that been distributed at all? No, we haven't distributed any money. Uh, we uh, review their roads at, at okay. times and quite frankly it seemed like traffic that was just associated with traffic from the kind of road 12 closure, things were operating very well. Um, Township roads might have seen a bit of damage from when the Trunk Highway 15 detour mm -hmm. went on, and so I'm sure the townships are, are discussing with, with MnDOT measures there, but we didn't really see any evidence of really increased uh, damage or, or maintenance because of the County Road 12 Well, I got detour. a call from a Cortland Township officer last night wondering if the county would be willing to help with some dust control expenses because I guess it's... The roads, I've, I've driven the roads, and three of the township roads are pretty tough, and one is not too bad, but they're all dustier and heck. Is that possible that we could reimburse them for uh, something? We could, we could look at it. Is but, I mean, again, it could be a lot of traffic just from the Trunk Highway 15 right. I'm sure that detour has to do with also. It. But yeah. it, they were complaining last board, year already. It so. may be more of a board decision. And then how do you quantify it, what that number is? Is there anything, Ryan, that well, we procedure? Can, I would suggest we put it on a line item for our workshop. Yeah, I, I and would. if we're going to establish any form of new policy, I think we need to drive deeper into it than that because we're going to have some of these same issues in lots of different locations. Right. Is my inclination. Yeah, I would. I would tread carefully with with this because a couple of years ago when they were building. 14 out to Nicollets, Nicollet Township had a lot of people cutting across township roads and wanted help from us and the Sheriff's Department went out to patrol but really that's a, a township and MnDOT issue not mm -hmm. a, a county issue. Can I follow up on that? Please. Mr. Chair, thank you. I just want to follow up on, the, on that question. You mentioned, Seth, about 15 and townships having to work with MnDOT. Do we offer any, at least, guidance to the townships? Here's what you need to do. You need, Or do they already know what they need to do in terms of working with MnDOT? If they got questions, I tell them who to contact or okay, who so to you're point available. contact. Yeah, yeah, we're always yeah, we available. Point them in the right That'd be helpful. Yeah, and I'm sure the DOT has been working with all the adjacent townships <clears throat> the way it is. Oh, and it might be a specific agenda item. We reinforce that at our next um, township officers meeting also when we do that. would be another way of at least getting that information out. So One more subject. Ah, what all townships are going to be eligible for that meeting on Thursday? Do you know? Um, any township that had damage due to flooding this spring. So you don't know? I don't know. Okay. 
Nope, I don't keep a tally. Um, Justin Block more than likely has okay. um, figures that townships have, have sent into them already. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. And to piggyback off that, we don't have a FEMA disaster declaration yet. Yeah. After this meeting, we perhaps will? Perhaps. I, I think it's encouraging that FEMA and state homeland security are coming for this meeting. I would right. imagine that a declaration will be forthcoming. And that's like a hundred and there's a fairly low threshold there. Yeah, and we've exceeded that. I would think so just with County Road 14. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So this yeah. is the meeting this Thursday morning at nine o'clock? Yes. And yep. that's here in this building? Yes, yes, it should be in the EOC. Yep. But the townships have a lower threshold than the county, correct? No, it's an overall threshold oh, for oh. the county. Okay. Yeah, it's a cumulative amount that the county, township, cities right. and if they have to the threshold, then that usually makes the financial yeah. conditions. Okay, Mr. Chair, this meeting, I believe Thursday, they come in and they just meet as individual townships with the FEMA person. Right. They go through the paperwork and... The yeah, FEMA is wanting to get a handle on estimated damages. They want pictures and whatnot to kind of wrap their heads around okay. what's out there. It's a it's an information gleaning meeting. So a first step, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Anything else? Thank you, Seth. You're welcome. Appreciate your time. What is the? Shall we? Um, We've got time for a break. If somebody, if the I was going to say, yeah, should we take a brief recess? And then when we come back, we'll convene the ditch authority and then finish the meeting. So we've got a time period, 10, 15 I need you back in 10 minutes. Okay. I'd like to convene the uh, ditch authority meeting. We have a consent agenda. I'd entertain a motion for the consent agenda. So moved. We have a motion. Second. We have a second and a discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. And we have a action where we need to set the ditch hearing dates for county row or for county ditch 23A, 27, 38th, 76A, and 78 lateral 1B. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I have received a petition from the um, Minnesota Department of Transportation for the rights to make minor alterations and changes to a series of ditches that that um, Mr. Chair just announced. Um, I would like to set that hearing date for June 11th, 2019 at 10 a.m. A uh, representative from the, D the DOT will be here to facilitate that meeting. This is an unusual action, is it not? It's somewhat of an unusual, but not exactly. When the Department of Transportation, they do have the rights to make minor alterations and changes. They will facilitate the entire hearing. Um, all we are really responsible for is noticing um, and providing the meeting, and they do take care of the charges as well. We just have to notify that the, to the landowners, and they will put it back to the um, They'll make their changes and put it back to the ditch with no cha no um, disruption to the ditch. Um, this is for a project that they are working on, um, Highway 111. So moved. We have a motion. Second. We have a second. Any other discussion or any questions? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Welcome, Curious. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting, the Ditch Authority meeting. Second. We have. We need a first. For, oh, you're, you're the first. Yeah, you got to say it when you nod. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> okay. We have a motion by Morrow, seconded by Limkey. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 I then would like to reconvene our regular board meeting and at the top of the order is our administrator. Thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, first item up today is a uh, section corner remonumentation project. Uh, we discussed at the January and April board workshops uh, 
to have Bolton Bank begin a countywide uh, remonumentation of our section corners. Uh, as we learned, the original survey was done in the 1850s in the county, and then uh, uh, a very rare occurrence happened around 1900 where we actually uh, remonumented all the section corners again with granite stones. However, uh, the issue remains is that uh, those are not being able to be identified uh, with a metal detector or, or even found. Uh, so uh, we've slowly over time uh, remonumented uh, corners as requests come in, uh, but we've only completed about 29% of the county. Uh, so the proposal would include remonumentation of the entire county. Uh, after our last meeting, we discussed uh, among staff uh, the benefits of doing the center of center of the section as well. Uh, we feel that that would be beneficial as well. Uh, there's been about 100 of those completed already with about, I think, 470 total in the county. Uh, in talking to Bolton and Mink, uh, just in the remonumentation process, they would have to locate center of section 25 to 50 percent of the time anyways uh, just to complete this project uh, just to tie everything out so staff feels that as long as we're out there doing this with we ask them to include in their proposal to do the center of section as well um, we would also like to start this year in west newton township because we're going to be uh, doing some road work there in the near future uh, where we'd have to do section corner locations and then we've also uh, added into the plan and I call it a plan because a lot of this is weather determined on the ability to go out and dig and then also uh, public works has to also be available for some of the locations to help dig so uh, what we get done in any given year will be very dependent on those two things uh, but we have included Ridgely into into the proposal for this year uh, Ridgely is a small township. It's only a partial partial uh, township. Does not have 36 square miles. I had our GIS staff look up, and we have 157 uh, locations left to do in those in West Newton and Ridgely. Uh, so the estimated cost of that this year would be about 88,000 if we were to get all of that completed. And again, uh, the proposal for this year is not to fund this with tax. Uh, tax levy dollars it would be to fund it with uh, funds that we collect in a recording process where fees are collected to uh, go towards the improvement of our land record system also we would use uh, ditch buffer aid that we, re we receive uh, around the areas where the ditches are located to help uh, determine uh, accurate buffers in those areas um, so those funds alone, we have over 700000 available uh, that have to be used for very specific things just like this. So the proposal would be to use uh, those funds uh, to do that. Uh, the proposal I have here is very general. We, we still have some of the legal contract language that the county attorney is reviewing. So I would recommend that uh, the board approve the proposal and then have it contingent upon final contract language approved by the county attorney. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a brief question. Uh, does the per corner cost also, and do the numbers also include the centers? It, it does. Mm -hmm. So it it's does. The, the flat rate. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Yep. We've negotiated, a, 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 I'll call it a reduced rate. Uh, with Bolton and Bank, they're giving us their rate that they use uh, with MnDOT contracts because of the high volume. Of, of work that it includes and we've also incorporated into this uh, the use of interns to help offset some of the costs there will be interns of Bolton and Mink. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, Ryan, just to, to be clear, why is remonumentation important to landowners and yeah. taxpayers? Yep, thank you. Um, Minnesota statute uh, 381.12 actually implies that counties have the responsibility to maintain uh, the section corners and uh, the legal uh, descriptions of, of the county. Also, it helps uh, preserve property rights. Uh, legal descriptions are more accurate. It helps eliminate uh, title problems. Uh, property tax system is more accurately and fairly administered. And it helps with the management of drainage systems, right-of-ways, and environmental areas as well. And I will add that uh, 
all of the 13 townships, uh, all of our cities and the county, our entire uh, property tax system is based on an accurate uh, map of, of parcels. And so to have this available will make things uh, uh, more fairly, to ec or more equitable and fair in the administration of property taxes. Okay, thank you. I have a follow-up, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Please. So we know that it should be done, but have we done any work on budgeting for this type of an expenditure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, as I mentioned, we've built up a fund balance of about, uh, well, almost 800000 of the funds I mentioned that each year, if they're not used, get carried over and can only be used for certain expenses under statutory authority, which these are. Uh, so we've got a good reserve balance available. Um, depending on how fast the board wants to complete this project uh, and what our budgets look like in any given year, I may or may not bring forward a recommendation to use some property tax dollars to help help with the expense, but uh, at this point for 2019, it would all be uh, funds that we have currently available. Thank you. Jeff, Jeff. Yeah, oh, probably Seth. So I, mean, I think I asked this, but I don't remember the answer. What if, what if the corner section is like in the bottom of a drainage ditch? You don't know either. It's going to be tougher to locate. <laughs> We're going to have to dig a little deeper, maybe. And in a road, like that's the little steel plate in the road, if right? They, if they can get all the other corners and then they can basically mathematically get back to that center. But it just depends on what you find in all the other corners. And it could be a stream or something, too. Yeah. They may calculate what that position is based off. All information. So that might never place. get marked. More especially like if it's they wouldn't get marked if it's underwater. Or or but it would be in the GPS system and accessible. Yeah. And that's the upside of actually adding the centers then too, because yeah. it gives them another mathematical point to do the draw from. And right. then in the county roads it's the little round steel plate. That's the marker. Yeah, there's usually a little cap there. Right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Chair, I will add that uh, we've discussed um, sending out letters to the landowners in the townships as ahead of doing these projects. Uh, Bolton and Mink thought that was a great idea to do that. Uh, as we know, they're gonna have to go on to private property. Uh, they, there is statute that says uh, landowners have to allow access with advance notice. Right. Uh, but we thought that this would help uh, convey what we're up to uh, when they see Bolton and Mink trucks driving around and periodically public works vehicles digging. Uh, so we would, if approved, <coughs> we would plan to send letters out here real soon uh, to the landowners in those two townships. Um, and uh, Just as an aside from that, do we have some exposure as far as crop damage or anything else with regard to this? I'll do defer to Jackie and Seth. I guess we never had that discussion. How? How we handled that in the past. I'm guessing both of them will identify ones they need to find after the crops are up and go in in the fall when those crops are gone. To that would be. That work. I don't think there's any intent to go out and just start destroying crops. To right. Yeah. Find a section. I'm assuming that, but I just I didn't know if we if we had a history of how we handled those. Yeah. Unlike a, a road project where right. we, this had a time we need right. to be done timely, this we have flexibility with. Okay. So both of them <coughs> will work with with those things as well okay and bolton mink may go out hand dig first to see what they can find mm -hmm. right right that, that's what they'll typically do is hand dig right it's just okay. too deep then i assume that's what they're going to call us but right then maybe have a list of the problems when yeah. okay. Okay. okay and we prefer to have a bunch of different locations at one time so we can knock out Still, one. Yeah. I know staff is excited, Jackie. This has probably been talked about 15, 20 years, ever since you've been here, about doing this. And um, I think it's well worth the, the investment to, uh, to have an accurate, true map of, of the county. It's very, very beneficial. And, um, and we're locating, we're taking requests every year anyway, so eventually we'll, we'll eliminate those requests. The Anything else? Correct. Also, uh, so if this is not correct, if the old way was not correct, 
but it's still the legal way if it's off 20 feet or 30 feet or whatever. So are those people's acres adjusted on, okay, thank you. It's very rare that a, a section is a true section of right. those acres. There are pluses in my, some are bigger, some are smaller. So, but it's usually 20 feet or 30 feet or? Oh, it's very small. Okay. Completely variable. Okay. We do. I think we, we do. Oh, no, we don't. I thought we did. I've been so long. So moved. Second. We have a motion to second to proceed as indicated based on the final resolution and input from our county attorney on a final contract. Is that consistent mm -hmm. with everyone's desires? Yes. Hearing that, let's call the roll. Tomorrow? Yes. Lipsy? Yes. Colvers? Yes. Grantle? Yes. Yes. Thank you all for that. And we have our Rural Energy Board membership. Yes, uh, years ago we discussed being, being part of this organization and just never took action to do so. And recently we revisited it uh, at the workshop and it seemed like there was interest uh, in, in pursuing it. Uh, membership cost is $2,500 a year plus they, they charge a $1,000 entry fee. Uh, meetings are typically uh, the fourth Monday of odd months at one o'clock in Slayton and to become a member in addition to the fees uh, it is a joint powers of the uh, member counties I believe there's 17 counties that are members uh, the county we need to approve a joint powers agreement and then uh, select a voting member to attend and then an alternate member what's the will of the board Mr. Chair, what's the uh, opinion of the county attorney on the joint powers? I don't think she's seen it yet. I did take a look at that, and that's something that um, Brian and I have had a conversation about needing to be. I think the plan is for the organization to look at it. Yeah, uh, Michelle and I we both pointed out some things that probably need to be addressed in there, uh, but they are in the process of reviewing their joint powers. And of course, with 17, maybe 18 counties involved, that's going to be a lengthy process. So we feel that just moving ahead, adopting the joint powers as is, and we've already conveyed our wishes on what the changes would be uh, for them to consider. And then later this year, likely adopting a revised joint powers. So what we would be doing, if I'm hearing you correctly, Mr. Chair, please, is that you'll be making suggested changes to this joint powers agreement that fit today's world, maybe. Because this was probably drafted 25 years ago or whatever? Oh, uh, not that long ago, but I, we're not sure how thorough it was reviewed. But 17 other counties have adopted it. We don't know how many county attorneys have reviewed it ever, but. Uh, I, there's, uh, there's just been a few changes on drafting joint powers probably since it was drafted, and I. Right. Um, have no doubt that when it is redrafted, those things will be taken right. into consideration. I'm still waiting to Mr. Chair? Sir. I went to that meeting as an observer, and I think it's a good group to be with. I am a little surprised they told me we could get in uh, prorated for the middle of the year, but that's not the case, according to their bylaws. Okay. And I guess I don't have a big problem with that. Uh, so I move we join. I have a motion. Good. Second. We have a second. Any other additional discussion? And just to be clear, my understanding, and John, you may know this, this group had originally formed to provide policy guidance on wind yes, development that's and my transmission issues, but has broadening perhaps its scope to renewable Any energy renewable. more generally. And every county west of us yes. is in, and county south. south of us are in, Blue Earth County is in. Right. Well, and we're, and seeing, so, an, we're seeing an increase in our solar, we're seeing an yeah. increase in other, and we're going to see an increase in things that we haven't thought about yet. So I, I think being better to be at the table than on the table. And Sibley so. is drawing, is leaving, I believe. I, I believe so. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, to, to add to Commissioner Morrow's points, uh, 
yeah, they started out as, as a policy group for wind, but have broadened, and they do hire a, a lobbyist mm -hmm. uh, that is very active at the at the Capitol. And uh, with our solar growth, or peer growth here, and possibility for, for tax credits through yes. that, uh, mm -hmm. there's there's a financial uh, incentive to, to be part of that discussion as well. Any other discussion? We have a motion to join. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Mr. Chair, um, since we're joining, uh, can I nominate uh, Commissioner Lipke to be our representative? As long as you accept the position of alternate. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Jack, you would enjoy that group, I think. I know a bunch of those folks. I know you do. I mean, um, but I think we're required to provide an alternate, are we not? Correct. John, are you willing to serve? Yes. Yes, and I think you'd be the excellent choice for alternate. You're so kind. We're here to help. We're with the government. <laughs> <laughs> we have a motion for uh, asking Commissioner Lipke to serve as our primary contact with the group. I'll second that. that one of those. <laughs> and Commissioner Kolars to be the alternate. Is that okay? Is that acceptable? Yeah. Or did you want to do it? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. We have a motion. I need a second. Second. We have a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Is that anything else? Is there anything else you have for us, Ryan? Uh, that's it for today. I don't have my paperwork up because I'm still prepared on certain things, so we're going to start with the Commissioner Committee reports. Commissioner Kolars. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on April 23rd, we were all at the joint Blue Earth County uh, meeting here in St. Peter, and I really appreciate that opportunity to meet with our neighbors. We've been doing that for 15, 20 years now, and I think it's a good, uh, good opportunity for us to just compare notes. Uh, April 26th, the CHS meeting. May 2nd was our MAPO meeting, where we discussed Mankato Area Planning Organization transportation issues. I attended on May 3rd the safety, uh, the required safety module. We were all at the CJC meeting on May 8th. And uh, May 10th, uh, I attended the All Seasons Arena meeting uh, as an observer, shared some of that information back with board members, and as I mentioned, I did not go there carrying any promises, only to learn to see what, uh, what their interests were, what the future might hold. Um, we are supposed to get some sort of communication. I think, Ryan, they'll send you some sort of communication about where they see that happening, and that's the end of my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Commissioner Graham. Um, in addition to the joint meeting with the Jack and the rest of you, these joint gigs, we had an HHS planning meeting. Was that in this session too? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A Brown Nicollet Community Health Board meeting where the disc golf course at Nicollet Public Schools is really getting the publicity mm -hmm. from the ship. Mm -hmm. That was kind of nice. Yep. I mean. Um, I had a joint ditch gig up in Gaylord that I will be missing next Tuesday's board workshop to go back. It's a problem ditch up there. Um, I also attended last land use training with the planning and zoning staff and planning and zoning members. Um, the Connecting Nicollet County graduation ceremony last week. I had a Region 9 board meeting and I took the safety training online. Hmm. How fun was that? Did you pass? Uh, evidently, I <laughs> back. So. I got a couple of perfects. Yeah, well, I breezed through it and didn't necessarily watch the videos, so we got her done. Commissioner Morrow. Well, I want I want to thank you, uh, Ryan, for setting up the Blue Earth County joint meeting. I thought that was that was helpful and uh, met with uh, constituents on more than one occasion about roads and water. So Ooh. thank you, Seth, for getting back to folks. I do I do appreciate that, and I know they do as well. Uh, the retreat uh, that uh, Marie mentioned and the environmental health meeting. We had a drug court meeting. I think I may have been the one oh. commissioner. 
at the drug court meeting. Uh, safety training, I did it in-house and I thought it was really interesting, more so than I expected, so thank you for the good times. Uh, <laughs> at, at, uh, safety training, and then the criminal justice meeting that we just had. Commissioner Lipke. Well, common with most of you, I was with the Blue Earth County Commissioners. I went to the comprehensive plan meeting here. Terry was there, right? Yeah. Uh, met at Tim Weibel's with the DNR, uh, Justin Block, a few other folks about the high water is uh, affecting at least two farm sites around there. Uh, had the social services workshop which was uh, good meeting meeting these people. Uh, Marie and my good friend Bonnie Dinsmore from Lafayette has been in contact with me and she has organized some kind of a deal there because especially with the detours and people who don't drive uh, that the grocery stores from New Ulm would deliver to the church in Lafayette nice. and the people would each pay a share of that $15 um, delivery charge but guess what think people can't decide on one grocery store <laughs> so they might use two or three uh, was it Brown Nicollet with the rest of you and many calls with the landslide on 14 County Road 1 and uh, well County Road 12 and the dusty township roads and the beat up township roads or back to me thank you John um, again all of the prior mentioned meetings that we were all in attendance to. Uh, thank you. I'd like to give special recognition um, to our criminal justice meeting that was coordinated by our county attorney and Commissioner Morrow. Thank you very much. It was informative. It was engaging. Um, I appreciate it and thank you for that. My additional things um, were my MRCI components, and then I attended with Marie the Connecting Nicollet County uh, graduation. Very nicely attended, uh, a fun event. It's always, and I would commend one of our individuals here who is uh, participating in that. I, I, from what you said at that meeting, I think you found it valuable. Um, we as a board has historically been very supportive of that organization and helped um, and have many employees that are graduates of the program. So uh, again, thank you all for that. And nothing extraordinary other than just to inform you that I have been enlisted to also serve on the executive board of MRCI. Ooh, so congratulations. So that um, lets you know that that will change. Um, that's all I have. I think we are in the position to approve per diems and expenses. And Move it. I don't think we have any meetings coming up, do we, in the next round? <coughs> no, not unless any commissioners would like to attend uh, the NACO annual conference in Las Vegas, Clark County. That's well, July. if you are interested, you need to you need to get that process going because it's it's going to take a little bit. So, uh, talk to Ryan and talk to Lynette about getting those things done. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, is this your last meeting with us, Lynette? It is. It is. Hmm. We won't so, be connecting with her today, right? um, I think I can speak for the board in wishing you every great success in your next endeavor, but you will be remembered and missed. And so thank you for all your service to the county and certainly all of the the services that you've rendered this board and and um, we appreciate you so thank you very much for that I will definitely miss having her around and it's gonna be difficult to replace her but the one benefit is I'm gonna lose 10 pounds because I won't be <laughs> eating all these treats that she brings in all the time but well uh, you, I would gladly keep the 10 pounds that, that would, <laughs> you know that may be a consideration for employment you know if you have someone that uh, baking degree that, that has a baking yeah. certificate. Yeah. Well, she could still mail them down here. Well, so you know, yeah. uh, there's and that for a while possibility. she'll be driving right, right by here. Right so, yeah. so. Yeah. Just fling out the window. Yeah. Yeah. A round of applause. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And, and we do appreciate that. Very right, helpful. So, do we have anything else for the good of the cause? Mr. Chair? 
I'm sorry, I thought we did. On the per diems. On the per diems. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second. All those in favor of signature saying aye. 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 Unanimous. Now, can we, Madam County Attorney has something for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to um, note that um, the there is a effort to start a substance abuse coalition for our youth. Um, and that is uh, scheduled for the second meeting um, is scheduled for tomorrow. Um, forgive me, I don't remember the full name. It's NAPAA, and I don't remember what it stands for, but it is the, uh, uh, the Nicollet County Coalition for Youth. Um, lots of um, response and interest in addressing substance use, for, substance use, use amongst our youth um, with the hope of getting a grant um, to uh, facilitate those services. So. Um, it's being coordinated by human, well, health and human services, but there's two representatives from um, public health or, and human services that are leading it. So, so, so we look forward to hearing more about that as things progress and hopefully we're successful with the grant. Would it be helpful as a letter of support from the board also at some point when we get to that grant process? I will convey that. I think it would be helpful to have that. Um, I'm excited because it'll help coordinate um, services for St. Peter and North Mankato and rural Nicollet County as well. Right now, I think everybody's kind of doing things um, independently, and so it'll help coordinate it all. But I will convey that. Mr. Chair, before we go, we should uh, note that we have our county employee appreciation picnic today. Yes, we do. And um, thank the staff for their efforts to put that together. It really worked out well last year, and thank you for Supplying the hair nets that we'll be wearing. In I have I have hair nets and aprons. Um, it's always a festive and photographic event <laughs> that we enjoy. John and I don't have to wear them, do we? Really? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 one of those shining moments. It is. It's, a, it's a very special. <laughs> I think I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I think we're digressing here. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you very much. Meetings adjourned. Thank you.